American Axles uh, thing is special. I mean, is a drivetrain test uh, 13, you know. And so we, what we've got is uh, the uh, Dana Spicer people made uh, differentials and stuff for and rear ends for Chrysler for years and years and years. And I don't know if it was because their machine equipment started wearing out or whatever, but some of the Jeeps and stuff that we were uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s were making whining noises and stuff right out of the factory, <laughs> like the, the axles were noisy. And so they started using these American axles, and this is about the American axles. Now, I will tell you that the differential is about the same for the most part. I mean, there's some minor differences from one to another uh, on these, but what we're going to do here, um, this particular, uh, these particular axles, this is a brand of axles uh, you got right here. And uh, each one of these was available with a gear ratio of either 373 or 410. Now, what does that mean? If I say 373, what does that mean? If I got 410 gears or I got 373 gears, or you, can you intelligently discuss that? Do you know what it means? 3.73 turns of the drive shaft for one turn of the wheels. Simple as pie. You probably knew that, didn't you? 410 would be 4.1 turns of the drive shaft. Now, that's going to be a lower one. That's why people that like to race, they have the lower, you know, the one, more turns of the drive shaft because you got, you know, there's more power there. Uh, now, these American axles are made of iron, and each one's a full floating design. It means the axle shafts don't support the weight of the vehicle. Now, these are, you understand the difference between a floating axle and a regular axle. On the Ranger, what's holding the weight of the truck? The dead gum axle. The wheel is bolted to the axle. The axle's got little bearings that are inside the, I mean, the, the steel axle that drives the truck down the road is actually also supporting the weight of the truck. All right, now you guys have all seen three-quarter ton trucks or one-ton trucks or whatever, and they got this big uh, thing sticking out of the middle of the wheel with bolts around it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a floating axle because the weight of that thing is being supported inside that hub, and the axle is going, just going out there and it's bolted to the outside of the hub. You can take the axles out with, without even taking the wheels off with the truck flat-footed. Because you just take those big those that real that ring of bolts out, and Lundy probably saw a lot of that stuff on military equipment, floating axles and stuff. My so, dad's truck's got that. Huh? Yeah, because their dad's truck's got that. So that's a floating axle, is what it's called. Now the reason that's stronger is because once again the axle is not being supported. I mean, is, is the axle that's driving the vehicle down the road is not carrying the weight of the vehicle. All it's doing is taking twisting motion, right? And so that's really important uh, to look at on them heavier duty trucks. Three quarter ton and up will have that kind of thing. But in these particular ones, they're talking about that. Uh, now, when working on this particular type of axle, the American axle is a brand name. Uh, there's some information that's going to be found in two places. An identification label originally applied to the axle during manufacturing may also not be present when a vehicle sent for service, right? Uh, so basically, the code on the label has got the manufacturer part number, revision level, and actual ratio. Now, have you seen on these Ford axles that we've got the little metal tag that's under one of the bolts? Uh, what You know what that little tag is for. You know that you're never supposed to leave that little tag off. You're supposed to put it right back on there. That's like when you're, if years ago, when we used to rebuild carburetors, they'd have a little metal tag under one of the screws that had the information about that carburetor on it. And when you went to get a carburetor kit for that carburetor, you had to have that. Well, the axle is the same way. It's going to tell you the axle ratio, what size it is, and all kinds of other stuff about it, if it's locking differential and all that. So always put that little tag back under that bolt so that somebody can do it. And on the GM, it's stamped on the axle tube. On these particular ones here, you know, apparently American Axle, on, on the ones that we're talking about here, had put it on a, a, a sticker. Uh, but anyway, if the label's not present, this one here will have it stamped onto the axle tube like a GM. So you, can, you just need to look for that. Uh, but whenever you're ordering parts for it, if you're wanting to get something, you got to talk to tell your parts guy that number. If you just walk in there and say, I've got a, you know, whatever it is, model Jeep Cherokee or Dodge truck, and it's, and it's got, you know, this whatever axle under it, if you don't give them those numbers, they're going to say, well, I need the axle number off of it. And one of the things I used to hate was whenever I'd go into the parts room and the parts guys would ask me a question I didn't know how to answer. Like I'd pull in there and I'd say, I mean, like, you know, I want to be like a dummy. i go in there and I'd say, I need a fuel pump for this Taurus. And they say, is it a 16-gallon tank or an 18-gallon tank? I say, I don't know. I mean, what, you want to drain the gas out of it and pump it in measure it? You know, how am I supposed to know this? You know what I mean? But then I, then I found out when I laid under the tank, I could see the number that was actually pressed into the thing, it was an AB instead of an AA, it was an 18. And then I figured out even farther, if it's a station wagon, it'll have an 18-gallon tank. 
<laughs> so, I mean, that, but they didn't have that information in the parts room. And sometimes they'll ask you information, even now when I call advance, they'll ask me something that I don't have any way of knowing what it is. I say, well, you need to tell me how I need to figure that out. You know, well, you got a VIN number on it. Okay, I can do that, you know. I and mean, I don't know every little thing about every little car. I mean, who does, you know what I mean? But you need to know as much as you can. All right, so here we go. So you got a pinion, pinion flange. You know what a pinion flange is? A pinion flange, who's taking that rear axle, I mean, that, that chunk on the bench back there, who's taking that apart? Yeah. You've taken it apart and put it back together. That flange where the drive shaft bolts has got four holes in it is the, what they're talking about. That's a pinion flange. Now, you know, some of them have got a yoke that you just stick your U-joint up in there and it's got little straps. That's a different style. But most everything nowadays is using pinion flanges uh, with, with a few exceptions. Um, anyway, that's... Uh, well, the ring and pinion gears are a match set on every differential. You can't just take a, ring, a pinion gear and a ring gear from two different axles and put them together and expect them to work good without making noise. And I've said this a zillion times, gears in these axles can look good and sound horrible. Hey, come in here, girl. Uh, all right, let me fix that, which I can get me a, a ticket there. Okay. Three, four. All right, let's take that. I'll take this. Let me look at this thing right here. Moody, this look like what we need? Yes. All right, he had that on the shelf and didn't even know it until he called back and got the right thing. That's it. You know what that is? Yeah, this right here is. That's okay, yeah, put that stuff on the desk, please. Thank you. Yeah, this is the one. Tell him I need a bill for this. Okay. And um, anyway, that's uh, this is this is what we're going to put in the Pontiac to stop the dim, the dim headlights from blinking off and on when they drive down the road. And me and Moody, we were busted our fanny looking for the location of this thing, and it turns out it's just plugged. <coughs> it turns out it's just plugged into the power distribution center under the hood, and it's got a little thing. We just worked, worked, worked on that, didn't we, Moody? Here, take this box. You know what to do that when we get out of here. A heater core is leaking on that thing too. I may get uh, Dustin to put a heater core in it. That'll work with it, Dustin. All right, here we go. Uh, the adjusters on this thing. Now, who remembers if you're setting the, the uh, backlash on these differentials, you got to move the ring gear closer and farther away from the pinion. You got to move it far away, it increases the backlash. You move it closer, it reduces the backlash. On this one, you got to do that with shims on the Fords and the Chevys, but on this one here, as cool as all get out, because you got screws you turned. You set your preload and you move it. You screw this screw and this screw. You know, you're moving it back and forth. You got me? Uh, and that, you'll be able to see that if you look in the schematic, and that's the coolest way to do it. The adjusters are used to set back crash and differential preload. Now, what's preload? Tell me what preload is. We've I've told you about preload before, but I don't know if any of you can pull it off the top of your head. That's the amount of pressure that's supposed to be on the bearings before anything is turned or whatever. Because why do you want preload on there? How many of you guys, you've taken a little, you know whenever you take the little uh, cutter key out, screw the nut off when you're pulling the rotors off the front of an older one like the Ranger? You know what I mean? Like if you're going to pull the, the brake rotor off on the Ranger, you got a little dust cup, right? Pull the dust cup off. you got a cutter key. you got a castellated nut. You screw, or a, you know, a nut with a shell over it. When you screw that nut off, and then you, you got these cone-shaped bearings. When you screw that nut on there, the amount of pressure you put on those bearings is your preload. Now on those, you don't need to put anything except finger pressure on them. Why? Because you're not actually, those bearings aren't on a gear. You know what I mean? But a gear, those gears are is so critical that those gears have got the right relationship to each other that the pinion depth is important how deep the pinion is into the, uh, the other gear. And the backlash is important too. And you don't want those things doing anything except turning. You don't want them moving this way and that or moving around and all this kind of stuff. So those things have got to be pretty dadgum tight, right? Okay, so after you install new differential bearings in an American axle and proper backlash is set, you got to check the total torque to rotate measurement. There is a worksheet on this, you guys. There's a worksheet about... On one is you take the drive shaft out, you get the little torque wrench I give you with the adapters, and you put on that big nut, that the pinion nut, and you see how much it takes to keep it turning. 
Now, in order to get the right reading, you got to pull the tires and the brake drums off because you don't want brake drag, you know, screwing up your reading. But that's one of the things that, you, if you'll notice, I've actually got a picture of you on that worksheet with that thing doing that. But anyway, make sure preload is important. The crush sleeve, you remember I talked about on the pinion? And you remember seeing the little video that I made about replacing a pinion seal? you got to put that right back where it was. Uh, if you, for some reason, go too far, you can't just loosen it off a little bit. you got to pull it out, put a new crush sleeve in there, and you got to go back and keep checking your preload as you go until you get it right. You know, tighten it a little bit. You can't just zip it up with an impact wrench. And you can't use a torque wrench to tighten it, but you do it, use a torque wrench to see how much it takes to keep it turning. It's really important. All right. Okay. The differential pinion is retained in a differential housing with a snap ring. You got to remove the pinion shaft from the case. You got to use a hammer and a punch on the side of the shaft that has a hole. Uh, basically, on some of those, they'll have a snap ring that is actually inside a dimpled hole, and the only way you can get it out is find the hole that enables you to unseat that really stiff spring steel snap ring. Uh, steering gear boxes are made that way sometimes. You'll notice that. If you ever see a ring that there's no way to grab hold of it, it looks just like a piece of wire that's bent into a circle and it's dimpled into a thing and it's supporting something, then look around the side of it, you're gonna find a hole. And when you find that hole, you're gonna stick something in there and you're gonna bump it and get it out of there like that because there's no other way to get it out. That's why they put that. Okay, so a new feature of the American axles is a track right helical differential used in the limited slip versions. I'm gonna show you guys this on a picture because you need to see it. Because you may be confused if you don't look at it. And you guys can look at this stuff with me too. Because there's some really cool pictures here. It's got a two piece case and two side gears and doesn't have any clutches that makes it easier to disassemble and put back together. Now, who was that that worked with me on that 88 F-150 that had the limited slip? You were in, a, in on it. Who else was in on that? Was there somebody else involved what? with that? Huh? That big S-shaped spring that was between the, that was a bear, wasn't it? Had to stack all them clutches in there and put that. Well, this one here is different. Look at that up there. See the, uh, hey, I have that worksheet. See that? New feature of the American Axles. That's your little track right. Limited slip differential uses helical pinion gears and brake shoes. You got that little shoes in there. Okay, so wait a minute. All right, there you go. You've got a two piece case, two side gears, and they no clutches. That's what, that's what I was talking about there. And it makes diagnosis pretty straightforward. It won't move when differential failure occurs, though. You got me? Differential failure occurs, it just won't go anywhere. Uh, as far as lubrication goes, the fluid is different from the other ones. Uh, both the front and rear models use synthetic gear lubricant. Uh, and no friction modifier additives are required. Friction modifier keeps it from going whoop, 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 whoop when you're going around the corner on those old kind. These don't have that. Uh, lube specs can change, so you got to consult your service and see how they're actually making, marking everything whenever they're working on it. All right, so right here. Now, watch this. Look at, you can see the words as good as I can. Six step troubleshooting procedure, right? You got to verify the symptom is present. Uh, Moody, what did we do on our Pontiac? We let it run. We let it run and we, we saw the, the dim headlights go out, didn't we? That's verifying it, right? Okay, and then well, he had already replaced the, the dimmer switch, which didn't amount to a hill of beans because it still did it. All right, we kept on going. All right, so there's some kind of noise related issue typically on the rear ends. You got to determine any other related symptoms uh, by any other rotating components, tire transfer case. Uh, how many of you guys have been smacked around uh, on a, I don't know if you've done alignments in here enough of, some of y'all hadn't done alignments yet, but sometimes when you're trying to do an alignment, somebody's got a, a, one pulling and you check all your alignment angles and everything is okay, it turns out that when you rotate the tires from left to right, the pull's the opposite direction. So the whole thing was a tire pull and there was nothing wrong with alignment angles, you got me? So tire pull, you remember that, Joe? Yeah. You're gonna remember that whenever you remember that at the uh, that place up there, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, don't forget that. All right. What are you doing? You sharp my pencil. Uh, he dropped your pencil. Oh. No. All right. All right then. Axle noises are, re are related to vehicle speed. Uh, how many of you guys have ever heard axle noises? What does it sound like? What axle noise did you hear? Uh, I think I heard one yesterday. On. What was, it? was it rear wheel drive? Yeah, no, it's all wheel drive. All wheel drive, actually. Okay, so what did you hear? What kind of noise was it? It was like, oh, I don't know. It was kind of a 
Squeaky noise. Oh, a squeaky noise. You're going to typically, if you got in a rear axle, you hear a whine or a howl or a roar or a rumble. It's kind of like a Riley squeak, but yeah. I got high pitched rabbit. I mean, I now, when was it doing this? I mean, was it doing it when you were moving, when you were bouncing what? Just pulling in the little, you know, the little elevation between concrete and shop floor. Uh -huh. It was making all kinds of racks. Yeah, well, was, was that suspension noises rather than axle noises? No, it was... Uh, it was related to the movement of the vehicle, not the bouncing of the... Okay, so that's how you can determine that. Um, but anyway, uh, whatever the nature of the axle noise is, and you got to determine what it is, we used a chassis here for that. We had one, a 2003 Explorer one time, that came in here with, with roaring noises. And we had to figure out what to do with that thing. So we actually got our chassis here, which has got little microphones. Put your headphones on. You can click it from one microphone to the other, and the little electronic device. And we determined that the, the differential was really, really, really noisy. So we tore the differential down, and the bearings were shot. I mean, they were all brindled and pitted and all that kind of stuff. So we put bearings in it, put it all back together, got it all set up just like it was supposed to be. We drove it, and we still had a roaring noise. It sounded like bearings. And, and I'm not talking about... The rear axles are going to whine, ring, ring, ring. you're going to hear that singing. But on this particular one, the hubs, which are on the end of CV axles out there, they were bad too. But I mean, it wasn't like we misdiagnosed anything because when we pulled the bearings out of the rear end, they were shot. I mean, you could look at them until they were bad. And the ones out there, when we cut them apart, I've still got pieces of them around here somewhere, they were bad too. And they're not even swimming in the same wall, so I don't understand all I know about that. Um, Okay, how many of you remember the story about the RX-7 that had rear axle bearings that were bad? And they changed the rear axle bearings, and a month later, it's back with bad bearings again. They changed the axle bearings again, it's back with bad bearings again. I heard about this at the school in Jacksonville when I was in the school. So they need to just go ahead and... They replaced the whole rear end, but it, those came back roaring a month later, and it had bad bearings again. So, wow. We had a bad ground. We had a bad negative battery cable connection at the engine block. And what it would do when you go to start it, that current would run down the drive shaft, go out there, arc on the bearings, come back up the park brake cables into the body, and it starts the car. Every time you started a car, it would arc on those bearings. Bzzz, bzzz. They bought the car back, and they took it to the school, and the instructor at the school found it. Whenever he was doing an electrical class, he found out there was a lot of voltage drop in the negative side and it was actually shortened by arcing on the bearings. That's well, after the, yeah, after the bearings have rolled, though, you can't tell what it was that did it. You see what I'm saying? You just see they're shot. They, they're all pitted and everything. But anyway, that's an interesting story. Um, but see, like a, uh, a lot of times you need to look in places you don't think you need to look, so there's a lot, a lot going on there. Uh, pull the differential cover, look at the fluid for signs of contamination, look for bits or pieces of metal, uh, measure <laughs> backlash. What's backlash, guys? Some of you guys have measured it. What is it? This. Yeah, bingo. This is like a way of ding, 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 ding. How much space you got between your gears? It's imperative that that be right. It's got to be within a certain range, and it'll tell you whenever you look at that and all that. So, all right, let's go to the next page here. Now, look at this. You, what, look at that picture right there. Look what the guy's doing. See that little bitty torque wrench? And how he's got it adapted up, and he's got it on that nut, and he's actually trying to see how much it takes to keep it rotate, rotating. All right, so look at your gear contact pattern, applying the marking compound to the ring gear. Some of you guys did that too. Uh, and continue it by removing the differential case and measure and record the pinion total torque to rotate that. So the inch pound torque rate, subtract the value from the total torque. See, basically, you want to know what the preload is. You want to know the preload's right on your pinion, and you also want to know it's right on your, your carrier for your ring gear. So if it's right on both of them, you know, you're going to basically get a reading for your pinion and you're going to get an additional amount of torque that's added to your other one. And so you say, that's why he says uh, measure the uh, PTTR and subtract it from the TTR to calculate differential torque to rotate. Got it? Yeah. All right. Remove the pinion flange. <laughs> that's perfect English. Yeah. And the appropriate pinion driver to remove the pinion gear and remove the pinion bearing and measure the, you know, see how they're doing all this. I mean, you guys have took this apart. Now, those tools look familiar. The tools that you see out there, they look they look very, almost, some of them are exactly the same as what we used out there, right? You got them? Special tools. Yeah, special tools. That's right. That's that $700 tool kit that's got all that stuff in it. All right. The opinion bearing cups have got to be installed in the axle housing. Set the pinion depth measurement. Everybody in here, I think, has done that, I think. Has anybody not torn that rear end down and put it back together? Okay. It's really important that you do that. 
Uh, and you see their bearing, see how they press the bearing off, see the shim? This looks familiar to you guys, doesn't it? The ones you used to have done it. You two guys have done it and all that. So anyway, all right. Now see this right here? Uh, crucial to the operation, adjust the backlash. Mm -hmm. Look at this, that determines bearing preload and gear contact pattern. Now on your Ford and your Chevrolet, what you're supposed to do is you're basically supposed to take shims. The shims are a lot of different thicknesses that go on each side of this carrier. And you're supposed to have a bunch of those shims on hand, preferably in the parts department and all. And you're, they are all different thicknesses. So you're supposed to find one set of shims that takes all the slack out, but you can push in with your thumbs. And then as you're setting your backlash, you're basically going to subtract from one side and add to the other side and get it to where it's right. Then you add four to six thousandths to each one of those shims and you use a special tool to knock it in there while the thing's spread out. And then that gives you your preload. Now on this one here, you just use these. You See how the guy's turning that nut right there. Can you see that little nut thing? It's a little, it's got holes in it. And it's got threads on it on the inside. And when you turn it, you basically can move it back and forth like that. Uh, install the differential case into the axle house and tighten the left adjuster till the ring gear is seated against the pinion. Then back off the left adjuster four holes and install the adjuster lock and bolt. Now the adjuster lock bolt keeps it from moving while you're driving. All right, so look at that. New bearings. Wait a minute. What do you see up here? Look at the first question. Total torque to rotate. New bearings, 30 to 50 inch pounds. Used bearings, 45, 25 to 45. Now that's not what it takes to get it started. That's what it takes to keep it going. Now look at these pinion gears. See that? You've also got a pinion gear marking question right there. Now look at that. You got a pattern analysis right here. Go down a little bit. No. Oh, this way? Just right there. Yeah. All right. All right. Now, what do you what do you know? Nothing. All right. Look at this. 24A. Let's look at 24A. All right. 24A is what? <laughs> That's the proper pattern. Confirms correct pinion depth and ring gear backlash. Now you can take one of those Ford axles apart over there that's never been under a car and you'll see white marking compound on the gears where they did this at the factory when they built them. Right? Uh, contact pattern uh, 24B is an example of an incorrect pattern. The ring gear is too far away from the pinion. Okay, here's 24B. You see 24B. See that? Ring gear is too far from the pinion when you see a pattern like that. Got me? It's like it's at an angle. Yeah, see that? It's supposed to look like this. If it looks like that, the ring gear is too far from the pinion. Okay, now look at 24C. Huh? Yeah, Prussian blue works for that. There's other marking compounds you can use. Prussian blue works for it really good. Okay, now look at 24C. You see that pattern right there? Yeah, 24C. All right, read what it says 24C says. All right, the contact pattern shows the ring gear is too close to the pinion and you need to increase the backlash and move the ring gear farther away. A pattern that looks like 24D, right? Means the pinion gear is set too high. Confirm the, and that's, in other words, the pinion depth is wrong. Confirm your pinion depth and change to a thinner shim. You're gonna make put a thinner shim and if the pinion gear is set too low, can you tell that this would be time consuming? Yeah. <laughs> but you gotta do it right. If you put it together so that it's just crammed in there, and I did that one time when I was young and dumb, I said, I know how to bolt stuff together. I rammed those gears in there, and I drove at, at uh, Plymouth down the road, and it went, yang, 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 yang. It was just singing up a storm. And so I called this guy in Alabama that I had worked for for a little while, and he says, yeah, what you got to do is you got to paint it like you're painting your porch, turn it through, look for the pattern, set everything up accordingly. That's basically all he told me, you know. But you, as long as you know what the pattern is supposed to look like, and you get an idea from seeing these, look at this one here. Look at 24E. 24E sh uh, shows confirm the pinion depth and change to a thicker shim. So that pinion depth right there is actually too, what, shallow? Right? Yeah. So you want it, you want it deeper. I mean, uh, basically you want it to stick up more. So the pinion, whether how deep the pinion is in there, and that's what those tools are for, right. for that we're doing. Oh, huh? Which one are you after? 24D. Right? Look at that question down there. You see it? Yeah. Pinion gear set too high on that one there. Uh huh. You I was see just verifying where the yeah. label was for which picture. Yeah. 24D. You see it? Yeah. Pinion gear set too high. That means the thick the shim's too thick and it's too close. It's too sticking up in there too much. Got it? Okay. All right. There you go. Okay. There you. There's. There's that thing right there. All right. Now. 
Uh, come on down here. All right, you see that little, this is uh, retainer ring and quarter key uh, rear hub bearing keeper. That's rear hub removal right there. Now, you guys, see this big old, watch this. You see that big old place right there? That's where the axle comes out of and it bolts to this. That's what I was talking about earlier. You notice how this right here with the axle pulled out, this big old tube, it's got great big bearings on it, big old nuts, and it's what's supporting the uh, weight of the vehicle. All right, the rear hub seal, you got it may separate in two pieces when the hubs are removed. You can see that right there. All right. As long as you see all the pictures, you're good. That's the last page of that. All right. All right, there we go. Okay. Now, uh, all of this, there will be a pop test on all of this tomorrow, but we're going to go ahead and do this, this right now. No, I'm kidding. All right, let's do this. Let's jump through this thing and let's get done with it. Uh, who got, what'd you get for number one? Uh, after new print differential bearings are installed. What's the proper backlash is set? What should the total torque to rotate measurement be? 30 to 50. 30 to 50 when setting up the pinion depth measurement. The arbor will not turn in the arbor discs after tightening the bearing caps to specification. Uh, what should be done next? You're supposed to confirm proper disc alignment in the bearing cradles. Okay, during a road test to confirm an actual noise concern, you identify a low pitch sound you classify as a growl. Boy, somebody messed up the spelling Indeed. on that. What casual causal components does that indicate? Damaged or worn bearing. Yeah, that's going to be bearing there. Uh, a rear hub seal on a 10 and a half or 11 and a half inch American axle should only be replaced if it separates into two pieces when removing the hubs. Is that true or is that false? false. That's false. After performing a gear tooth contact pattern on a 10 and a half inch American axle, you contain a pattern uh, similar to the one they show in the picture there, you know, and that pattern indicates, and uh, what's that? What's that pattern indicate? Incorrect pinion depth, too yeah. high. You got that? Everybody like that? Too high. Let's flip it over. Technician A says information about American axles is found on a label attached to the axle tube. Technician B, Technician B says information is stamped into the axle tube. Are hey, both of them right? He's right. Both of them are right. Which of the following statements about a track rat differential is not true? The clutches are the, the clutches are the differential are the only serviceable parts. Yeah, listen to that. That was not true. The preferred ring gear backlash setting for American axles is between B. A. Actually, five and B. seven thousandths. When uh, that would be C. When assembling an American axle after. Uh, Adjusting pinion depth, which of the following components is reusable? Not the seal. The pinion seal is actually reusable, believe it or not, really? on that one, yeah. After doing that particular job, after adjusting pinion depth, you know, because you didn't really hurt it. You I think you want to replace it anyways. Yeah. yeah, I think so too, but you know, but you can reuse it in that particular case. Which of the following is not true about American Andrew axles used in Dodge trucks? Uh, there are no variance markings on the pinion gear. Rear axles feature above center pinion mounting. Friction modifier additives are not required or a triple lip pinion seal, excuse me, is used. B, rear axles feature above center pinion mounting. It's below center pinion mounting and that's why you need the, you know, that's what high point gears are all about. Okay, that's got that.